Welcome home. We are WNST. Towson, Baltimore. Baltimore positive. We are AM 1570. We hope you set a spot on your radio dial when you're driving around. Um, we're also out on YouTube and Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn and all those cool places. Uh, Luke is going to be around all weekend um, waiting for a really busy week next week. The uh, Sunday night football matchup. We have the Buffalo Bills and the uh, Ravens doing national television. And then, of course, the Orioles playing all weekend, but really in waiting and prepping for, um, I, you know, we'll get some, we'll get some times and some dates over the weekend as these things get settled in. Luke Jones joins us now. He is Baltimore Luke. He can uh, be found anywhere. The internet travels. He'll be back and forth from Owings Mills to Camden Yards all of next week. And certainly uh, the ballpark on Sunday night. We'll get to football in a minute, Luke. Let's uh, stick to baseball and talk about Whatever that was on Thursday night against the Yankees, it was not a sweep. Um, sort of felt like it could have been. Um, really, it felt like I called it fall training for 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 baseball this week. It felt like sort of a weird um, prequel from a pitching matchup that would look like a playoff matchup. Two big dogs, Cy Young guys facing off. Five innings, maybe seven or eight next week if you had to, if you had to. Um, but an interesting game until... It wasn't interesting anymore, right? Yeah, and I think you saw the Orioles here hedging their bets a little bit in terms of obviously still needing a win because the Tigers won again on Thursday afternoon to clinch that top wild card spot. Magic numbers one in that regard. They need one win or the White Sox to beat the Tigers once. Uh, so that's what we're talking about here. Not to have the sure. home game. To have the home game, right? Sure, sure. I mean, of course. Uh, games. Yeah, we're talking top wild card. Yeah, the yeah. top wild card spot. So. I think part of this equation, and you and I have talked about this and debated this a little bit, and I agree in the direction the Orioles are going now, especially on the heels of Zach Eflin not looking all that good his last time out. Five walks, but they're clearly, uh, what they did Thursday night was done with designs of Corbin Burns pitching Tuesday. And some people will say, well, what's the big thing here? I mean, Tuesday would be regular rest in terms of four days of rest. If you look at the second half of the season, He's typically pitched on five days rest. I mean, they they have not skipped a fifth starter uh, when they've had off days. They've taken advantage of that to give Corbin Burns and everyone else in the bullpen uh, a fifth day. In fact, you have to go back to, I, I think, early September. He pitched August 28th at the Dodgers, and then he came back on September 2nd against the White Sox. Uh, and, and then in late July uh, into early August, those were the last times that he pitched on, on just four days of rest. So he's going to be doing that on Tuesday for game one, whoever they're playing, whether it's the Tigers or, or the Royals uh, at this point in time. So that's why he was lifted after 69 pitches. Now, I think it's certainly debatable that could you have left him in for another inning? Uh, they clearly weren't punting completely because they brought Yenier Cano in in the sixth inning. Uh, if Cano pitches – like Cano, right? Uh, I mean, the good version of Cano, then you're still down one nothing. You're still in the game, but he struggled. They didn't score a run until the ninth inning anyway. Uh, I mean, Burns, as dominant as he was, gives up the solo home run to Stanton. So ultimately, they didn't swing the bats, but the bullpen did not do a good job. So uh, clearly their opportunity to clinch the top wildcard spot and home field on Thursday night was, uh, you know, that hopes for that was was were dashed, but uh, they got Burns in a nice final tune-up, 69 pitches. They got him out of there early. He looked great. The cutter looks so much better than it's looked all year, uh, and we're seeing a more dominant swing-and-miss version of Corbin Burns that, frankly, you're going to need. We've talked about this, especially now with without any of the designs of upside from Grayson Rodriguez joining this rotation at some point in time. Uh, it's Corbin Burns and Zach Eflin, and, and I don't say that with any disrespect to Dean Kramer and Albert Suarez, because they're going to have to start games too at some point uh, if this team pitches uh, or plays w deep enough into October. But, you know, you need Burns and Eflin to be the the veteran stalwarts, right? You need those guys to be your studs uh, if you're going to make a deep run. So I understood what they did, that, st what, what they were doing there. I don't really have a problem with it, even though, you know, it, it was certainly a winnable game when, when Burns left, but Again, they didn't score any runs until the ninth inning. So uh, they, they were going to need to score at least two to win, even when Burns left, and they didn't do that. So, uh, But, you know, you come away from it a little unnerving to see Cano struggle again. Uh, we talked about the fact that he had forearm tightness 
uh, and had what eight days that he didn't pitch until recently. Uh, he pitched for the fifth time in eight days on Thursday night and you know, walks. You know, the, the the sinker hasn't looked as crisp, uh, gives up three runs. Uh, so, you know, that's something I, uh, I'm i a little concerned about. You know me, I, I'm not high on this bullpen. I haven't been high on this bullpen since the winter. Uh, but uh, after seeing it, it, a one to nothing game turn into a nine to nothing game kind of quickly, it, it does conjure up your worst. You know, yeah. you and I got into a nice little fight earlier in the week about baseball and pitching. And do you believe and do I believe and who believes and are we believing and who's buying tickets and who's going next? Is there really a belief they can win the World Series? Um, I do, but the bullpen better look better than that. Well, yeah. And and look, I, I again, this isn't about they can't do it. But if you're looking for reasons to feel confident about their ability to do it. 30 days with the Orioles bullpen. <laughs> it, cer- it certainly needs to include the best version of Yenier Cano. And for him to look like he's looked over the last week or so, that's a little unsettling because, okay, from the left side, Danny Coulomb's back, although Cool- Coulomb can obviously pitch against right-handed batters too successfully. Uh, you have a better version of Gregory Soto uh, in recent outings than we've seen. So that's good. CNL Perez is another one, right? I mean, he's been in the circle of trust for most of the second half. You know, with with Coulomb and Webb sidelined, it was basically if you got to the seventh inning with a lead, it was CNL Perez, Yenier Cano, Sir Anthony Dominguez. That's kind of what we were seeing uh, until Coulomb and uh, Webb came back. Perez wasn't good on, on Thursday night. So, you know, you're going to need this. I mean, as I've said, you're not going to survive if you only have a couple bullpen arms you can trust. You need four or five, maybe six, uh, especially considering the back half of, of the postseason rotation. I mean, Dean Kramer, Would you're you probably... expect them to baby the bullpen on Tuesday? If Burns isn't going 58, 72 pitches on, I, it, look well, at I mean, the way he looked. Depends. Like, right. it, I mean, looked, it, it looked on Thursday night, he could have gone seven, seven, you know, like it, if it's Tuesday or Wednesday, they won't be going to Cano, right? I mean, and the argument in the bullpen or in the dugout, and oh. I want to pitch, you want to, you know, dude, you're on four days rest. I, you know, I'll hear all of that in a regular season game. And I'll also hear the people are like, we haven't clinched anything yet. Why are you taking him out? <laughs> you know, um, I'm not as worried about the weekend. I, mean, I don't think Detroit's going to lose Chicago. Detroit's going to come in here on a huge winning streak because they're probably just not going to lose Chicago. But, um, but Minnesota, I don't know. They better win this weekend, right? I mean, there's a little part of that that, the fan base is, come on, man, we haven't clinched anything. But then there's the other part of, well, if he looks like that on Tuesday, let him pitch. <laughs> you know, the season's on the line. I mean, that's going to be the difference Tuesday is that we're all going to feel that season is on the line feeling that you can only feel when the season's on the line. You know, you, there's no um, t- test tube for that, I, I don't think. Right, right. I mean, uh, of course he's going to pitch longer than 69 pitches, but uh, I mean, you just said Cano's not going to pitch. Well, then who who is going to pitch? I mean, Corbin Burns, I'm not going to sit here and say he's going to go nine innings on Tuesday. He's not going to pitch in the sixth inning, I'm saying, but it doesn't matter. If he comes in in the eighth and gives up four runs, uh, But that's my point. It's it's not about the sixth, seventh, or eighth. It's about whenever he's pitching. If it's a one-run game, you need the best version of Yenier Cano because who do you trust more? Uh, I mean, okay, Dominguez, Coulomb. That's what I'm saying. I, I mean, this bullpen whatever questions or, or confidence level you have in it, it must include a, the, the right version of, of Yenier Cano. So but I'm in agreement with you. And Corbin Burns will, unless he gets shelled, uh, unless he's really struggling and we see more of the August version of Corbin Burns and heaven forbid, that's what they see, but it's baseball. You never know. Uh, yeah. He's going to go more than 69 pitches. So uh, again, on Thursday night, if it were me, I probably would have had him at least start the sixth inning and see if he could get a quick inning and you pull him after 80 pitches, you know, 85 pitches. Uh, I don't think that would have been that big of a problem, but they decided to go in the direction they did. Uh, Brandon Hyde said that they talked about it. You know, that, that was premeditated. It's not like it was a surprise to Burns. I'm guessing Mike Elias and the brain trust and uh, the coaching staff all talked about this uh, going into Thursday night. But, but yeah, there is that little bit of an element of, you won the first two games of this series. You still had the the home field advantage in the first round to clinch. I mean, they're still in great shape there. Uh, I mean, if you're going to sit here and say that suddenly you have no confidence that the Orioles can win one game in Minnesota, and 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 you know, I, I think Detroit will probably sweep the White Sox because the White Sox are the White Sox, right? Although they played 
for relative to themselves, let's say, let's be very clear about that. They've played a little bit better the last few weeks, uh, but the Whites are. So the they've Tigers, won two games this month, maybe three. Yeah, exactly. But the the Tigers have just. Uh, I mean, the Tigers were trailing late in that game against Tampa on Thursday afternoon, and, and they score a couple runs in the bottom of the eighth inning. So uh, it's just where they are. So yeah, there is a little bit of an element there of. You know, did you mess with the mojo that you slowly but surely were starting to get? But then, in in response to that, I would say, well, why were you beat? Why were you shut out into the ninth inning if the mojo was so good, right? I mean, Garrett Cole shut them down, and the Yankees bullpen behind him uh, shut them down. So ultimately, again, they had to score at least a couple runs, even when Burns was lifted. They were trailing one nothing, and they didn't do that. So by the way, all I could think about was Garrett Cole. It's like he looks great. He's making all the money. He's the guy, and you know, all that, and now he's going to like sit around for 10 days, like yeah. literally. Right. And, well, and, that's, and that's why he threw 101 pitches rather than 69 and being left, lifted after five innings. So, uh, I mean, it's look, all things being equal, you'd r- much rather be in the Yankees position. Right. But, th- but we've talked about well, this. The next this- time we see Garrett Cole, fingers crossed is next Saturday in game one. He's rested nine days out, 101 pitches threw on the side on Tuesday and Wednesday. And we're up there and, it's on like Donkey Kong, right? Like literally, that's what you hope. You hope you see Garrett Cole next weekend. Yeah, but keep in I, I will say this. Keep in mind, Cleveland's only a game behind the Yankees for that number one spot. And and you know, they don't do reseeding like the, the bracket is set the way that it is. So the winner of the Orioles You'll know. versus whoever yeah. will will play the, the number one seed. So we assume the Yankees. I'm in I'm in agreement with you. That's my assumption, but uh these teams still have a little bit of work. That's why it's such an odd time, right? I mean I mean you know, going back to what the Orioles did Thursday night with with, uh, with Burns, I think if Burns had another day of rest and you know was was more into that five days rest that he's typically gotten in the second half, I'm sure he would have at least thrown 85 or 90 pitches. You know, I, I'm guessing you would have done that. But since he is coming back uh, a little bit more quickly than he has been accustomed to in the second half, and and that's the right move because if anything, I'd like to get Zach Eflin a couple days extra rest after. You know, not looking so good himself on Wednesday, but, you know, you have to have some confidence here that even without one of your top guys starting over the weekend, you know, uh, I mean, I, I would think you know, they're, they're not going to just completely, completely shut it down. I mean, K. Povich is starting Friday night. We'll see other than that, but they, you have to have confidence they're going to win one game. Um, you know, if the Tigers don't lose uh, and, and you know, at that point, then you've you've sewn up the the top wild card spot. You've sewn up home field advantage, uh, and then you can kind of use the rest of the weekend for whatever. But and and let's be clear, this is a Twins team that they won Thursday, but they've been circling the drain. I mean, they're they're three back. Uh, they're all but mathematically out of this thing at this point in time. So, you know, we'll see. Uh, but. How are you feeling about the Tigers all of a sudden? They're, 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 we were wondering all year, well, the, the Orioles are going to make the playoffs. They're going to make the playoffs. Yeah. And I kept saying they better win game one. They better win game one. They better get, they're going to get the best pitcher in the sport. <laughs> yeah. Look, I mean, you can keep saying the better win game one thing, but it, it's the postseason, right? And look, even if they don't get the Tigers, go look at the Kansas City rotation. I mean, Cole Reagans is, is going to be a probably a, I, I, off the top of my head, I, I don't know if he's going to be second or third in Cy Young voting, but he's going to be up there. I mean, he's had a heck of a year. They've got Lugo. I mean, uh, the Royals have the guy that in a in a world where Aaron Judge doesn't exist, you know, Bobby Witt would be MVP of the American League. He's been that great. So, you know, I, I've had a few people ask me, would you rather face the Tigers or the Royals? The Tigers are the hotter team, obviously, and they've got the this... Royals have the weird thing with the storm going on, right? They're down in Atlanta. Right, right. Uh, so they have some weirdness going on there, but the Royals have been the better team over the bulk of the season than the Tigers. Uh, and, you know, you kind of look at their rotation. Okay, they don't have Scooble, but like I said, Reagans and, and Lugo, I mean, they've they've got some good pitching. So whoever they play, this is not going to be a layup for the Orioles. I mean, like as much as everyone's warm and fuzzy about the fact that Westberg's back and Arias is back and they got Coulomb back and Jacob Webb and Mount Castle. You still have to go out there and play. And well, it wasn't I nice seeing Corbin Burns look like Corbin Burns? Corbin Burns has looked great the last three starts. I mean, this is this has been the best version of Corbin Burns we've seen as an Oriole uh, in terms of swing and miss in addition to getting the results. I mean, we saw him get results, but he hadn't been 
the Milwaukee dominant Cy Young version of Corbin Burns. And we're seeing much more of that. I mean, the cutter looks awesome. It's uh, almost I mean, unhittable. It drops off the table, right? And it makes his uh, it makes his other pitches that much better than two. Uh, when when you have a dominant pitch like that, it just makes your other pitches play that much better because now you're looking for that more. And then whatever else you're throwing, I mean, he even threw a sinker at one point, uh, which is a pitch he throws, I don't know, ten percent of the time. I mean, you see a few of them a game, really. Uh, he even threw a sinker, you know, kind of working off of what he's done with the cutter. Uh, that just looked great. Uh, and the, 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 I forget which hitter it was, but they were clueless on it. So, yeah, uh, I mean, that's... Well, they don't have to be all be strikes for him to 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 be dominant. They they will swing at balls if he's doing it right. Sure, sure, exactly. I, I mean, there's, you know, there's there are throwing balls that are, you know, it, it's not a strike out of your hand that that's not a competitive pitch, but the best pitchers will throw something that Starts out looking like a strike on the outside corner, and then before you know it, it's five five inches off the plate. And, well, your and best pitch is always o two, not two one. Sure, sure, exactly. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean Thursday night it was disappointing, and again, I'll I'll hear leaving them in there a little bit longer, but at the same time, they didn't score any runs. I mean, if they had scored, if they were leading three to one, and they pulled him, and then the bullpen gave it up, then then you'd be even, you know, you'd be angry, right? You you would say, wow, they really squandered an opportunity. They had to score some runs and they didn't. And obviously, Thursday night's game to... doesn't matter in this. In in you know, even if they go to Detroit and they pissed themselves all weekend, it well, win on Tuesday. Where wherever the game is, wherever you're playing, you got to win on Tuesday. And you better be at home. I mean, at this point, it better be at home. Or we'll be talking about Thursday night. But I don't think that that was in Brandon Hyde's mind when he was negotiating with with, with Burns in the dugout. I think it was, dude, you're coming back and pitching in four days in the biggest game of all of our lives around here, and we got to win Tuesday. Yeah, shout, and you, you and know. again, I the conversation we saw in the dugout I, that who knows what that, that is. Yeah. That what no, my my point is that wasn't the first conversation that that topic had come up in terms of hey Corbin, you're coming back on Tuesday. We're flipping you and Eflin. You're not going to throw 100 pitches on Thursday night. I mean, you're just not because we want you to be fresh. We want you to be as sharp as possible. We don't want you to have. We don't want a scenario where you're a little slow to bounce back at when when you're throwing your bullpen in a couple of days and uh, and all of that. So, so I, again, I get that element of it. Just would have liked to see the bullpen give the Orioles a chance and the Orioles offense give them a chance uh, because again, they did not score until the ninth inning. So you, I know the butterfly effect changes everything in terms of one event in, in a game, but they were still trailing one nothing even if the bullpen doesn't do what it what it does. So. Uh, you know, I, I think, again, for me, the biggest concern coming out of Thursday night was seeing Cano not look sharp once again. Is the forearm bothering him? Who knows? But he was in such a role, you know, in such a groove. He was on such a roll in August into the beginning of September. I mean, best we'd seen him look all year. And we've talked about this. He was kind of up and down in, in the first half. Uh, but, you know, he started to issue a few more walks than you'd like again, which he had kind of eliminated that. Uh, and, you know, just not looking quite as sharp. So you're hoping over the next four or five days, I don't know if we'll see him pitch at all, but I, you, whatever you want to do, you want to try to get him right because any any semblance of, of a, a deep October run for this team, they need a strong bullpen. And to me, I mean, Yenier Cano has to be a big part of that. I, 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 it, I struggle to see where they're going to get enough innings from right-handed pitching uh, if Cano's not, you know, right at the top of the list with Dominguez in terms of getting that done for them. And Dominguez will be in the back of the list because he'll be the last sure. choice, not the sixth inning choice. Luke Jones is here. He's Baltimore Luke. Although in, in, in baseball playoff games and knockout games, this thing gets the next Thursday. Who knows how it's going to go? Uh, the storm's down in Atlanta. Weird things are going on. Luke will be uh, not only uh, monitoring the Orioles all weekend, but also down at the football stadium on Sunday night. Uh, anything that's uh, on the Ravens, just the offensive line. I mean, I, we've done long segments. Vic Carucci's up talking about the Bills. Where you know we, we've written about Harbaugh this week. We've written about the offense this week and Lamar and their role and where all this is. Um, the offensive line again and injuries and Linderbaum and Voorhees and uh, and Rosengarten and and what the rotation will look like. It feels like they they liked what they saw against the Cowboys to some degree because there wasn't a lot of substitution going on. And now we find out that Voorhees, as you pointed out earlier in the week, uh, might not be able to get the post on Sunday night. Yeah, I mean, on on Thursday, Linderbaum came back. Uh, He was limited, but Tyler Linderbaum, if he's on the practice field, he's going to play. I mean, he's 
he's kind of graduated to a Marshall Yonda type guy where it's like, even if he misses some time, if he's logging a limited practice or two, he's going to play. So I don't have too much concern about well, him. Well, you want him under center. If there's anything, of course. that changes everything. McCary would be the backup though, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. But he's going to play. But right, exactly. I mean, McCary, yeah. you could see McCary at left guard because I think Voorhees, you know, the, the ankle, which, you know, I went back and watched it. It was on the very last drive. It was that first down on uh, the last drive, what, two plays before Lamar hit Zay Flowers on third down to basically seal it. And I know Lamar's run a couple of plays later officially sealed it and put him in victory formation. But I saw it like uh, his foot, it, Lamar, it was the keeper that Lamar had and they kind of just clipped each other uh, a little bit. And I think that's the play it happened on for Voorhees. He was slow to get up. I remember seeing it during the, the, the game broadcast and, and thought, are they going to blow the whistle? But then he got up and he, he only finished played two more game. plays, three more plays. Didn't right? look terrible. It wasn't yeah. Like... yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it wasn't like he was limping around looking awful or anything like that. But I, I noticed that I took like a mental, you know, a mental note of that at the time. Uh, but, you know, still wasn't practicing as of Thursday. Um, you know, we'll see. I mean, if he's out there Friday and, and is able to to log a full practice, that changes things a little bit. But you're talking about a young guy here, inexperienced starter, not the kind of guy that they're generally going to have confidence in if he misses the whole practice week. So if he's out and, and to me, he's the one that's in the most danger at this point in time. And, you know, I don't think they're going to rule him out. They'll probably list them questionable, but it'll be a legit questionable. Um. You know, it, it, it could be McCary moving this, We haven't had guard. a really big injury report, like in in real terms for the team. The, the team's been pretty healthy the first month. Like yeah. we haven't we haven't spent time talking. Is this yeah. guy going to play or is that guy going to play? It, it's been fingers crossed. They they've managed to keep their bodies on the field. They have, and everyone listening right now is hating you for for bringing that up because you just jinxed it. <laughs> but no, I mean it's. I don't believe that, in that's, jinxes, that's been one that's element okay. of this that that has been. <laughs> it's one one element of this that has been uh, fortunate for them, and you hope that continues. But you know, could we see shuffling? You know, I don't know if it'll be McCary at left guard, but it certainly could be. Uh, and if that's the case, then Rosengarten's at right tackle. Ben Cleveland's still your backup guard. If anything happens to Linderbaum, presumably McCary goes in. That might also, if, if Voorhees is out, that could also lead to Nick Samak being active. So you would have another backup option uh, at center uh, under that circumstance there's but a name we haven't heard a lot because of. nick samak yeah well i mean he's a seventh round rookie i mean you know he's going to be a healthy scratch every week if everyone else is you know healthy i mean that's just kind of you know, what you expect out of a seventh round rookie but uh, i think it, it's going to be interesting because you know one thing we talked about in passing and, and i'll just leave you with this though because it pertains to the offensive line you look at how the ravens approached the dallas game and it was just very much go out there and maul them it's an undersized group uh, Buffalo, it's interesting because they have a really talented defensive line, but you kind of look at the state of their linebackers and their safeties. You know, they're undersized. They've got some new starters there. They've had some injuries with Milano and Bernard uh, at the linebacker level. So I don't think the game plan is necessarily just have Derrick Henry run it 25 times again. I'm not suggesting that, but they're certainly going to plan to try to run as much as they can. And I think what you're also going to see is them try to exploit the middle of the field. I feel like this could be uh, an awakening game for Mark Andrews and Isaiah Likely over the middle of the field because I think they're going to try to test those linebackers and those safeties uh, in a way that Buffalo's first three opponents really didn't do that nearly as much uh, for, for whatever reason. Uh, so you know, it'll be interesting to see that. It's going to be interesting to see how the offensive line fares. I, I'd be remiss if I, I, I know I completely whiffed on this the other day. I was talking about Buffalo's offensive line. I didn't even mention Vaughn Miller's looking like Vaughn Miller again, all of a sudden, you know, after uh, coming back from the injury last year and just not looking right, not looking like the guy that was defensive player of the year candidate perennially. Uh, so he looks better. So that's another test for Roger Rosengarten. If he's lining up at right tackle. Uh, so, you know, we'll see. Uh, Roger Rosengarten was in middle school watching Von Miller win war, win win Super Bowls, right? Literally. He was, he was <laughs> exactly. So it's going to be a big test for him. If and even if McCary stays at right tackle, it's a massive test for Patrick McCary. So it's not something exclusive to the rookie. Uh, so step in the right direction last week with the O line. But hey, we talk about it all the times and all the time in terms of results. It's a week to week league. So 
anytime you're feeling good about something, okay, here's the next challenge. And this is a good Buffalo front. And it's going to be interesting from Buffalo's perspective. They love to stay in nickel. They, they, they generally have six guys in the box and they, re, they rely on their nickel or one of their safeties to come up and run support. And, and they do a good job for that, considering that they play with lighter boxes typically, but that's a different story when you're talking about doing that against the Ravens. So I think that's a matchup there that is going to be so pivotal either side, you know, whoever can really kind of exploit that matchup, or maybe we do see Buffalo play a little more base than normal, but that's typically not the way they like to play. Uh, so it's going to be fascinating, but I'm looking forward to this matchup. We talked about this at length the other day, uh, but you know, it really is a, a two kindred spirits, so to speak, in terms of two AFC teams, two teams with great quarterbacks, two teams that have had all kinds of regular season success over the last five or six years, and two teams that are, yes, still trying to get by the Kansas City Chiefs in January. So it's going to be a, a big matchup, and the Ravens are the more desperate team. So we'll see if that ends up being a, a factor in who ultimately prevails Sunday night. He is Luke Jones. He is Baltimore Luke. Um, he had nothing to do with the athletics leaving Oakland. I, I didn't even give you – is there anything you want to say about that? Because once – it's all over with. We'll play them next year in Sacramento or yeah. whatever. That ought to be interesting. Uh, that was – um, of all the ones that have played out, Cleveland leaving, the Colts leaving, the Oilers leaving, just go through and see uh, su Supersonics. Pick any of these teams that have left. Baseball teams haven't left much. I'm 56. I've got baseball cards where the Padres were going to be in Washington and the A's were going to be in Denver. Charlie Finley was going to move the A's to Denver in the late 70s. So there's all of these White Sox were going to move to St. Peter's, but everybody's going to move everywhere. The only one that moved was the Expos, you know, after the Rangers and the, yeah. and the Senators. Um, and that was almost before my time in 71. Um, I have some of those baseball cards too with Hondo Howard. Um, Ted Williams too. The A's thing for me, I've been in that ballpark a million times for football, baseball, like all of that, and that part, I, I know that part of the world real well. I, it's just such a, a tragedy for the sport and for baseball and for Major League Baseball to allow this stuff in the modern era, and we can go back to Al Davis and you know everything that, that goes on with laws and courts and lawyers and leagues and stadia and politicians and municipalities and politicians and all, all that goes into it. That guy's a piece of trash, dude. They, they never, I mean, that team doesn't even have a home. It's one thing to move a yeah. team and say, we're going to Oklahoma City. They have a building. It's one thing for Bob Ursay to say, I'm taking my team to Indianapolis because they have a brand new stadium and it's new and it's fresh and they don't hate me and I'm going to go. There ain't even a plan here. And so, so how Major League Baseball is allowed this to happen when there is no plan? Shame. My first shame for you, David Rubenstein. Stand up. Stand up for the sport. Stand, somebody should stand up. But nobody stood up for the people in Oakland the same way nobody stood up for the people of Baltimore. Nobody stood up for the people of Cleveland. Yeah. Nobody stands up for anybody. I get big-time sports. They should be managing their business better. And I say this across the board as a guy who's banned, as a Hispanic member who's banned from attending baseball games in this city after 40 years of doing my work. These people do any shit that they want, and people cry and they complain. Like, but they should be self-policed to a point. And the same thing for Harbaugh writing me last week and giving me godly strains while he's locking me out. Police your building. Police your people. Do the right thing in front of everyone, and everyone will say you've done the right thing when you continually do the wrong thing and you look the other way and see me getting hit with the brass knuckles and you don't see it. See the city of Oakland twist for 15 years, and Manford had no role in it. The other owners had no role in it. I mean – It'd be one thing if they had a stadium in Vegas and it was done and they were going, I'd say, all right, but this has just been, this is one of the uglier moves of my adulthood. And I've been an adult a long time. Well, and, and it's still going to play out in the way that they're going to be playing in a minor league stadium in Sacramento. Uh, I mean, you know, we're 20 years out the Expos playing in San Juan for crying. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, what are they I, doing? I mean, look, I'm not going to, pretend to be intimate to say that I'm intimately familiar with all the details that have played out in, in Oakland over the last, uh, I mean, this has been talked about since the early part of the millennium, right? I mean, but they've also this, lost this their basketball about team when, and their football when, team when Oakland was. Yeah. Oh, sure. And, and look, I, I'm not going to sit here and say that others don't take some percentage of blame. I, I certainly don't have a lot of time for most politicians. If, if you want my personal opinion for five seconds, uh, but Ultimately, this comes back to for ownership, 
for Major League Baseball, for the other owners, if you really, really want to make something work, you can make it happen. Now, it might take years. It, it might take a long time to get that done. But if you really, truly, in your heart of hearts, want to make something work, you can come up with a solution that will be viable, meaning you're not, it's not going to ruin your business. You can you make know, you're money. You're not going to, yeah. for, you know, you're not going to go bankrupt, anything like that. But ultimately, ultimately, if you don't, it, it, at the end of the day, if that's not your objective, if you don't want to make it work, if you're truly about just trying to get every last penny that you can get, look, that's your right, I suppose. But is it the right thing to do? No. Uh, does it end up breaking the hearts of a bunch of people who have no blame whatsoever? You know, the, the Oakland A's fans that actually went out there and, and had season tickets, even if it was only, you know, 5,000 of them on a nightly basis or whatever it was. Uh, it's just, it's sad. And, and I just, you know, look, there are always, there's always a, you know, here in Baltimore, we experience this, right? I mean, losing the Colts, but the Browns coming to Baltimore. Uh, the, the, the city's been on both sides of that. Hey, I want to uh, say something out loud because there's too. always uh, for, someone for being left behind. With, with with my situation and me holding Chad Steele and Greg Bader accountable from here while they allow you in to do your job and not me to do my job, our job for the people, it's all born of the fact that the Colts – were stolen from us. We had to steal a team while I was on the radio. I had to go out and say, give give the stadium people thousands of dollars for the right for a seat, right? Like, um, I did all of that, and still they hire an executive like Chad Steele who has no ability to do the right thing, no conscience about what is right and wrong, and certainly no conscience about what's happened to the city. I mean, I'm 12, 12 months, 12 months out on the governor of the state standing and doing a papal wave with the creeps kid who's creepier, who lied to all of them. This all happened 12 months ago. Like here in our city about stadium renovations, it's $600 million that we just gave to John Angelos that he could then push on and charge Mr. Rubenstein more and say, hey, I left you $600 million renovation for, for the stadium there. I'm out. Just pay me to do it. Give, give me extra because I, I got that deal done for you. Like I've watched it here, which is one of the reasons having Jeff Barker of the Baltimore Sun – be the only one that has access to David Rubenstein and to these people to write about all the money that's flushing back and forth because we would be the team losing our baseball team. If John Angelos really wanted to go to Nashville and depress this thing into the point where nobody wanted to come here and everybody hated him more than his old man, because Nashville will be worth $4 billion, not $2 billion. And the idea of this whole this whole ace plays to get the team to Las Vegas, have it be a shit show, and then sell it for $3 billion because it's not worth anything in Oakland because of the stadium. The same way that Art and David came here, got the stadium built, and still went broke and had, and had to sell the team. Um, but at least Michelle Modell and her, the grandkids are doing okay, but, and John Modell. But when you're talking about heirs and family, this Fisher thing – I followed it from the beginning because I've, I know a lot of people in the Bay Area. I've seen them lose the basketball team, the football team. All I was there when they lost the football team. I was literally at the press conference at the Biltmore watching Goodell and Mark Davis move the team. So, And Jack Del Rio at the pool coaching the team. So I, I've been a part of all of this. I just think in the modern era, this is all the more reason why journalists like me need to be keeping an eye on people like Chad Steele and Steve Bishotti and David Rubenstein and the Whistler that somebody – needs to be holding them accountable. That's all. Every day, every minute, to say, what are you doing? And is it right or wrong? And what are you doing with our money? The black wing. You know, no wonder they box me out. Because that's a joke. What they spent the money on, moving you into the corner of the press box, into the kitty seats, the Kevin Byrne press box that I'm banned from, that's what they did with their money. <laughs> they, with our money. So I don't know what the baseball team's going to do, but somebody has to hold them accountable because we've had our franchise stolen, because our baseball franchise has been threatened several times, really, going to D.C. before Camden Yards got built. I'm old. I remember all this. So from a journalism standpoint, from an investigation standpoint, from a speaking out loud standpoint, we are the abused city. I've been. I have my Baltimore cult stuff on the wall. I know what that's like. I know that feeling. Uh, and. As Tom Marr wrote on my Facebook, then you grow up and you realize it's business. Okay, 
I grew up in real life. I'm not waving pom poms. I'm holding them accountable. And I think the Oakland thing, they'll be held accountable when they show up in Sacramento and Las Vegas and there is no money. I mean, finding the money is the issue. And the Raiders and the and the um the gold the Golden Knights have found a lot of money in Las Vegas. <laughs> you know, I don't know where the baseball team's gonna find money, but the Orioles are gonna go and play there next year and the year after that. So it'll it'll be a continuing conversation for us. But it's disgraceful. And I just wanted to take five minutes and talk about how disgraceful it was. That's all. I, I don't disagree. Uh, and you can talk all you want about wanting to hold accountable. And I, I, I don't disagree with that. Ultimately, I mean, people have been talking about this Oakland situation in years. It didn't stop anything. And that's what that's what's unfortunate about this, because city or teams, sports franchises hold cities and local governments hostage, state governments hostage. And if you put your foot down and say no, someone else is going to give give them what they want. Uh, I mean, that's how this plays out. This is how it's played out for for decades now uh, in these scenarios. It's sad. I, nobody's I'm not saying that's right. Like, anything, be, be, that's the weird thing. He doesn't even have no, anything. But they're, they're going to get... But they're going to – it'll be a better situation than what it's been with the Coliseum. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to be – it doesn't mean it's going to be lucrative. That doesn't mean that they're going to thrive in Las Vegas. But they'll get a stadium, and, I mean, they'll – it'll be better than it was in Oakland, but only because they allowed it to deteriorate to the degree that it did, right? I mean, it's the same thing with Bob Ursay, what he did to the Colts uh, in their latter years, right? I mean, you say what you want about what attendance was at the end. It's because he'd completely decimated – what was once a proud franchise with lousy decision after lousy decision and holding everyone hostage and, and all of that. So, but ultimately it comes down to this and, and I'll leave you with this. And this is my last thought on it. The, the, the night before the last game, you know, there was a video clip of members of the grounds crew uh, actually scooping up some of the dirt from the, the warning track uh, with the shovel. And, you know, there, there were, A's fans, you know, uh, right, right along the, the, the warning track down the right field line, wanting some dirt from the Coliseum uh, and these grounds crew members who may, for all I know, may have gotten in trouble for doing it. But I, I thought that was a really heartwarming, but also very sad moment seeing that where grounds crew members are giving some of these fans a, you know, a small little sh shovel worth uh, of dirt to take home uh, from the Coliseum. Because you think about, you know, what that's meant. I mean, they won championships there. I mean, the Raiders played there. Uh, you know, I, I think back to being a kid. I mean, the Oakland A's in the late 80s were, they were the it team, you know, with Conseco and McGuire and Ricky Henderson coming back and, and all of that. I mean, and I watched the AFC championship game there good. when they won. I was there when they lost and I was there when they beat yeah. Jimmy Schwartz and the Titans with Rod Woodson and, uh, and, and when, uh, Ray Bachman and I sat, we sat in uh, Al Davis's seats up in Mount Davis uh, at the 20 yard line for the, I mean, uh, the best, the best baseball game I ever saw in my life. I'm glad we're talking about this. The best baseball game I ever saw in my life. My wife and I went to the game five of the playoff knockout Zito and Pedro Martinez, Twilight. It was the Johnny Damon stretcher game. It was as good a baseball game mm -hmm. as I've ever seen. There were 30,000 people in a 60,000-seat stadium for a playoff knockout game. I was with Julio, and his father was alive then. We, I walked up to the box office, and I bought seats eight rows off of third base 15 minutes before the game started for a playoff game. I think I spent $18 or $20 or whatever it was because they they begging people. This is 20 years ago now, right? This is 2004, I think that was. So, um, yeah, God, and how am I? I'm getting old, aren't I? I mean, really, I'm getting really old. Yeah, I mean, and, and what you just said, look, uh, that's why I said I, I'm not putting 100% of it on ownership because there are lots of challenges there. And there, are, I'm, surely there were politicians along the way who dropped the ball to some degree or, or another. And you can talk about a fan base. But again, I'll go back to my central point. If you really, truly in your heart want to make it work, you'll find a way to make it work. And that, and ultimately, that that's not what ownership wanted. And they're going to go to Vegas. Well, they'll go to Sacramento for the next couple of years, and eventually they'll be in Vegas, and they'll have a new stadium. And you know, it it might be kind of might feel kind of like what the Chargers are in LA, which is a team that doesn't feel like it has much of a footprint. And maybe they'll have a little bit more of one now with Jim Harbaugh. But you know, they they're they're there. They're profitable because all these teams are profitable at the end of the day. But is it going to be great? Is it truly going to be something that you can hang your hat on in terms of a legacy and being proud of something? I'm guessing probably not. But hey, if it means they're they're going to 
add money to, you know, they're they're going to add billions to their estate, you know, uh, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, then they'll say it's worth it, even if it means you broke the heart of a, uh, a city that's left behind. And again, it, it's always just sad. The fans that are left behind, whether it was five or 10,000 fans, whatever the Oakland A's core base was at this point in time, people still cared about that team. And they're people left behind. And it's always sad. And I'll, I'll always think back to, you know, it, it, I was only a baby, so I don't remember it. But, you know, my dad, like so many others in Baltimore, cried that, that morning, you know, with the Colts leaving in the middle of the night and sobbed and weeped. And, you know, that's sad you know, because, you know, those are the people who had nothing to do with everything that goes on with stadium BS and, and all the, all the different you know, fight, you know, back and forth fighting and politicians and owners and all of that. And, you know, it's just, it's really, really sad because you're talking about a team that, you know, the, between the seventies and the late eighties, uh, I mean, you know, quite a legacy in Oakland. That's you know, it lousy ownership. Uh, Charlie Finley the was the worst owner in baseball in the seventies. So um, look, man, I'll, I'll cut it off. You got baseball to watch football to watch. We got home field to clinch. We got a huge football game on Sunday night, which 28 years later, no one will ever mention that the, we stole the Browns team. You know, it, it does get forgotten uh, even by me when I write books about it. He is Luke. He is Baltimore Luke. You can find him anywhere. The internet travels this weekend. Um, I'm going to be at Costas on Friday, and then we're going to be at Pizza John's two weeks from Friday and hoping the Orioles are still alive and the Ravens aren't one and five. Um, big weekend ahead. By the way, the Commanders game might get flexed uh, on our bir- on my birthday weekend. So we, we, that looks like a tougher game in October than we thought it was going to be. I am Nestor. We are WNST, AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore. We never stop talking Oakland A's baseball <laughs> and Oriole baseball.